introduce your, uh, um, which is also kind of funny. The way, uh, the, the, this book, Dopamine City, uh, in Dutch, under, under Tussen in Dopamine City. It's uh, DBC's Pierre's, what, what is it, your sixth book or? I think it's the, uh, that's a good question. It's the fourth novel. And I think it's the seventh book, maybe. Oh, okay, okay. Lucky well, seven, I'm, lucky number seven. Yeah, I started with um, Vernon God Little, the um, book that with the fascinating title. I see it's all brownish now. It was kind of funny to see. Um, the, and this, I haven't read the ones in between, but I'm definitely going to read them now because I'm fascinated by this book. Um, the uh, the story about DBC Pierre, uh, other uh, listeners, is always the same. It's he had a debut, um, and the story about the debut is that it took a while to get it out, and he was rejected by a lot of publishers, and then it arrived to uh, an agent. The agent recognized uh, the importance of it, and uh, published it, and immediately it won the Booker Prize. Um, then there's the story about your name, what the DBC stands for. Then there's the story about what you did with the prize money. I thought, let's not talk about all that. Um, let's just get on with this novel. Thank you. You're <laughs> all right. <laughs> this you, novel that, 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 that fascinated me, um, you have to explain to me what the novel is about. Um, because, uh, no, well, let's just start. Let's just begin at the first part of the novel. Could you, would it be nice if you read a little bit of it so we can deconstruct together with the audience what this is all about? Sure, absolutely. I can still remember uh, quite a lot of this novel. And there's a, there's a piece, although it's a comedy, um, I can recite you a piece from a funeral parlor, I think still from memory. All right. Uh, which is, is worth a shot. And then we'll work on from there because the, the book obviously sets a certain story in motion. Yes. And, uh, although it's a black comedy, of course, it, it must have its real life. And so there is a scene where the protagonist, Lonnie, is... Uh, has just lost his wife and uh, he has to find his way to the funeral parlor. And he says, see if this works, otherwise I'll go to the book, which I have it right here. He says, the funeral place was a sandy brick bungalow wedged between Amos disposals and Dan's outdoor land on the westbound exit where the speed camera sits. By the time Lon found it, she was yellow. He had carried a bag to hospital that morning with aloe vera gel, mini pretzels, new books, fresh underwear, including the pair that said it won't spank itself, which was a therapy meant to run on wrongness, and a hastily framed picture of little Egan and baby Annie like hampers in the crooks of his thick arms. The bag was still on the front seat. She was in a coffin. He never lost the pressure to deliver that bag. A hovering black suit processed his credit card within sight of her straw-colored hair. It was swept up in a way she hated. She really hated that. The suit offered him a viewing with gauze over her face because some people prefer the distance, he said. It was wedding veil material. What kind of zombies were they? Lon ripped it off. He wanted to roll her on her side the way she always slept. He wanted to stroke her belly. He wanted to climb in beside her and have the suit nail the box shut. People always come back from these places saying she looked so peaceful and it's bullshit. She was a mess. If you saw her like this on any other day, you wouldn't say peaceful. You'd fucking call someone. Her head was small and loose on her neck. It wanted to roll when he stroked it. He settled it back as the terminal beeped and declined his five grand payment. He thought it would. He lied about it. 
better to vaguely pretend to have the money. Although, what were they going to do? Stand her outside until he paid? How about that? Beautiful, beautiful. And two things. It's, it's so different. The language is so different in Dutch, but still the way the images are evoked is the same. Yeah. It's completely I there. Oh, good. I can do a test on you. Do you want to try a test? Yeah. Because the one of the things that drove me crazy and is like an OCD of mine in this book was uh, to make it very rhythmic, like music. And let me try a little piece. I will read this because it's complicated. I'll try a little piece and you can tell me if the rhythm if the rhythm still works. This is about basically there's a story on the news about two runaways uh, children. And uh, this is about the social media response to the news story. And it says, most of the report was taken up with the response, not the story, the response to the story. The social media tis from Chinicalpa to Chaolin as the left, the right, the middle, the top, the bottom, the possessed, the dispossessed and the broken weighed into the chin pest. Feuding rappers, movie legends and influence peddlers swarmed behind the homeless man who'd found the pair entwined beside a shopping center grate. The super low whose vent it was had quickly sent a hamper in a giant bassinet which had then gone viral by itself as a healing sofa for all ages that increased one's sense of closeness to the womb. The homeless man would be partying with cyber stars that night. Millions were offering Josh as their baby name suggestion upon hearing that the fetus tended male. Accounts proposing Satan were being suspended on the spot despite complaints from kids called Satin who had issues with autocorrect. Human love hearts were forming on playgrounds and fields. Brands of perfume were pitching fat licensing deals and one more fraud had been detected among the apparently genuine crowd funders trying to float the young lovers forever. Outrage was otherwise the gist of it. Outrage for the pristine young rebels who had done what was right for their love and their child and were heroes oppressed by an old guard obsessed with this rigid and anachronistic bullshit was the gist of it. A dewy little family shattered by lumbering old white people, a velvety coupling as luscious as peach skin, squirming like sperm with young love with love, with love, for Christ's sake, with love, which we always said was the only thing to live for, true love, which every fucking song was about, yet whenever they actually saw it, the generation that taught us indifference set about crushing it as soon as possible, and that's just what happened here. Now trapped in a knot of impenetrable codes run by silver-haired golfers whose sex lives were lies or illegal or paid for. It's almost, almost too rhythmic to read. Uh, allowed. When you write, do you also pronounce it out? And do you also speak out aloud? Uh, in my head. In your head. Yeah. All right. I can see the I can see the rhythm. I can see the rhythm in there. So yeah, I do repeat it back, but I don't often read it aloud. It's the same thing. I can hear it. Are you searching for the rhythm, or does the rhythm? Of, is the rhythm already there and are you searching for words with the rhythm? Um, a little bit of both. The rhythm does suggest itself, but also it's just I'm trying to approximate uh, uh, real life. And the thing that we have in writing, which is I find fascinating, is we can control the speed of the narrative. And in the same way that uh, every day we have long, quiet moments and we have sudden bursts of activity, the speed of our life and of our day goes up and down. And I found that it's uh, much easier to suggest that locomotion uh, by using rhythm. And that does involve, it's not, compl it's not completely poetic, but... Um, uh, but I do have to watch out for the length of the sentences and, and the, the words. So yeah. that, you know, just because yeah. life, life really does roll along and ka-chunk, 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 
and that's one thing we can get in writing very much um, as you can in a symphony you know? yeah and then we get to to the special thing with the speed in this book and that that that's about the moment where there's a dj Wim Beere mentioned in this in the book <laughs> the very speed. famous a famous man <laughs> yeah yeah the speed goes up and up and up and up and that's why it, it drove me mad the book because in the end it's like it's like you're standing on speeds in the in a, in a big dance party and all the impulses are coming at you but we i, I want to give the the people the people that haven't read the book a little bit of a better impression of what the book is so the story starts with this man who lost his wife and raises his uh, son and daughter by himself um we get a, a, a pretty regular uh, well sorry I'm, I'm not meaning to offend you but a normal story about this man intertwined with uh, a story about uh, a, a, a company that settles near where the man lives, uh, a, a, a basically an internet company, a, a, a Facebook social media kind of company, data company, I should say. And um, the modern times are introduced by uh, the daughter of the, the man and by this internet company. And the story is still linear, normal, at the moment that one of the people of the internet company talks. And I wanted to ask you if you could uh, uh, read that part for us. It's a few, uh, it's a few pages before the big turn of the book. So we have a cliffhanger to what that big turn is. It's on page 112, 113 at the, um, in the Dutch version. I think it's the end of chapter nine. And it's when the... Uh, Got it. Yeah, it's when the scientist does a rant about social media. And I was asking if you, wondering if you could start with where she says, I have to translate from Dutch, don't use terminology like freedom of expression. Gotcha. Could you, from there on, uh, finish that chapter? Sure. Yeah, great. Yeah, we'll try it. Indeed, you're right. There is a young uh, uh, technology genius working on the latest uh, thing. And uh, his last sentence before that speech is, uh, we're talking about the most basic rights of expression. At which this wonderful scientist, my favorite character in the book, um, says, we're talking about masturbation sold as purposeful life. Pay attention, I tell you now, the model that made you boys rich of selling the market unfinished ideas built to decoy routines in the brain is not honest or agile enough for what we have to do. Life is real now, not beta. No longer progress, not the future, not version 2.0 or 3.0 or 5.0. It's a culmination. Do you hear? A culmination. Do not enter this project thinking kitten emojis will fix anything. Some drones and PR will make a difference. Wake up. It can be real and it can be elegant. Nature can be elegant. Mass can be elegant. Humans can be elegant. We have a choice. Let us be elegant. Now is the time. Look up from your screen. Don't sit in the north playing games. Somewhere a mother curls around a sick child. A woman hides shoes in a stranger's coffin to deliver to a lover buried barefoot. Scientists launch rockets with peanuts in their pockets for luck. Look at us. We're a susceptible biomass. This is who we work for now. At which the scientist, the, the techie says, wow, I'd vote for you if I wasn't so offended. And Professor Ruse says, you should be offended. Things are starting badly. As the local man said, I know where you want to go, but I wouldn't start from here. 
Yeah, maybe it's maybe it's better to stop here because okay. then it gets more to, to the real story. Then the book takes a different turn. The, uh, two or three pages later, there is, um, you could say the page is going to a split screen. So on the first you think on the left, there's the regular story line. And on the right, we see the, the, the kind of news feed that uh, Twitter or other social medias feed you constantly with, with all these strange and uh, absurd facts. Um, I got the impression, yes, this is beautiful, a writer who is writing about literature against the social media. And in the end, literature will win, but at first not because the Twitter feeds are actually more simpler to read. There are very little nuggets that you can take uh, to you. So I was thinking, oh, this is so beautiful how he lets literature win. But then towards the ending in the news feeds, the story is also coming back again. And that's when I got totally confused and I loved it. And I read it again and I was now reading for the third time. I read, a, I once heard a Dutch uh, writer telling me that every year he reread Marcel Proust à la recherche du temps perdu mm -hmm. every year. And I hated the fact of rereading, but this is the first book I actually wanted to reread at the end. Hey, well, thank you. That's very kind. I'm glad, I'm glad uh, you got into it. But, but do, do people get into it? I guess people will also throw it away. It's probably true, yeah. It, it actually, um, uh, what you're saying is most of the book is a binary novel and it has two streams. So it's, it's, it's exactly the same way that we're living in a sense that was, our real life is happening in front of us. But then on the screen, we have other things happening and we're doing them together. Um, so it is, of course, I found it comfortable. It takes a slight adjustment in the beginning, but it's important to mention, um, and maybe this should have been mentioned in the front of the book, you don't have to read the second column at all. In fact, the story, if you just stick with the literature, you, you, you know that something is happening here, but you don't have to read that. The story will pay off uh, just the same without it. And so- uh, could, you, could you read one of the nuggets from the right, uh on the right of the page, so that people get an impression of them. Sure. I'm asking you to read now for the third time, but that's because you're a really be a beautiful reader. Oh, that's kind of you to say, man. Okay. An international early life charity has offered specialist counselors to a number of junior schools whose hopes of honoring teen assault victim Jake Storer were dashed by environment agency officials. Children from as many as 50 countries had been participating in Life is Still Beautiful campaign, aimed at cheering up victim Storer by sending a flower from each of their countries to be gathered into a bouquet of solidarity. The environment agency, which oversees customs and quarantine procedures for the importation of plants, apologized, saying that some foreign species pose a threat to local flora. How many did you make up of them? All of them. Uh, there are a couple of real things, but... Um, is it true I, that teenage girls... 200. Is it true that teenage girls use bees to sting them in their lips so that their lips look more thick? Uh, it's probably been tried. No, I made that one up, but the, <laughs> I'm sure it's been tried already. Okay. Yeah. There are a couple that there are a couple of true ones. There's actually one in there. Obviously, I finished this before the pandemic. Um, but there is a story in there of a um, uh, a man who catches somebody's sneeze in a bag and successfully sues them for yeah. contamination. And they're talking about a whole new area of law is opening up, which is biological liability, where, in fact, if our germs infect you, they can prove that it's our germ. They can sue you because it's your germ. And yeah. that suddenly got much closer now. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That was one of the things that I thought that maybe this already happens in America. Um, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. It, I started, uh, I tell you what, Sander, when, when I started writing this book, I spent a year. And first of all, it, it's a very stupid proposition to, uh, to try and write the near future because by the time the book is published, uh, those things will have happened and it, your book will either be true or false. Um, and I spent the first year writing this, uh, inventing near future things that would happen, technology. And at the end of that year, all the stuff that I thought I invented already existed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I had to go back and make it to future proof so there's stuff in there which which will happen but it doesn't matter because it's not about the inventions you know it's about no. the human story yeah. the I, I read the book as if it was loc the, the the it was located somewhere in uh the us uh near quite in like a trump land almost white trash environment is that that's correct? good Less? that's good yeah. reading well, yeah. The, yeah, the city where he is, I don't name it um, because I wanted it to just be a white affluent city where a company like Google has obviously moved in. And at the time they're changing the world, they're also changing the city. Um, but I didn't want to make it a, a particular location. This is meant to be, it could be any city in, uh, in, um, in one of our European countries, you know, as well, it could yeah. also be in the states. Yeah, obviously yeah. the the rhythm is a little bit American. Um, I guess then, your writing style uh, has is, is must be well re received in the U.S. It's like the ex extreme uh, combination of the the traditional American show don't tell. And then the perfect metaphor and the perfect little image in it. Yeah, I don't think I get read very much in the States, but no, no, I'm published there. This one obviously is only so far uh, published in UK and, and Netherlands, simply because the industry has been stopped. There have been no festivals and there's been no, uh, no book fairs which is where the agents do the, the deals. And uh, so things are slow, but um, okay. but I think the subject matter of my books um, has made them more difficult in the States, in fact. So the writing style doesn't really matter. You know, that's... Uh, okay. What, what, what are, are there writers that you feel uh, are a uh, bit, doing doing the same as you are doing or that feel close to you i i don't know okay good other question um i was wondering i don't know exactly why but when i when i when i tried for the third time uh, it, it, it went into this book and then i looked on the internet and i saw all these exact same stories about um, uh, why you are called dbc and and what you did with your prize money i thought i don't want to know about uh, uh, your past your history about anything um but that wish did I also feel that a little bit in the book, uh, like a, a, a great uh, 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 reluctance or a great, no, uh, just problems with everything being in the open, online, on the wide, world wide web? Regarding me personally or the world? Like to individuals, to, to you or other individuals? Um, yeah, I, this is a very specific problem and, and the book is, the book touches on this, but it's a human story. So it's not, not completely a, a critique. Um, but my issue specifically isn't even so much with privacy, but it's with 
what we now know the big uh, social media platforms and the big technology companies are planning for the future uh, and how they're achieving that. And uh, I, that is extremely scary. I find that's the most terrifying thing that, uh, that I've seen in my lifetime. Yep. And, uh, obviously, I spent my young life under the threat of nuclear war and uh, you know, the Cold War and Soviet Union and stuff. And by far, when you look at the details of what your big tech companies are doing and why, this is much more scary and it's not a question of it's it's beyond privacy and this is really uh, a serious date rape and um and that you know that is scary so it i'm sure it's touched a little bit with that feeling obviously you know if you put your details on the internet um and something happens to you like you see celebrities sending pictures of them on their family holiday. And of course, then their house gets robbed um, because we know where they are with well, that. You know, that's just called the, um, you know, you have a choice of, of, of what's going to be public and not. And, um, and that's fair enough. But I'm much more concerned about the gathering of data behind all of those programs. And uh, that has really gotten out of control. And, you know, it, it's the scariest thing that we will face as supposedly free individuals. Yes, yes. And I forgot to mention that, uh, except for the part that you just read, the, the scientist um, who rented against the big data companies, there's the, the, the special thing in this book is that it's not only rants against it, and it's not meta against it. I, it reminded me a little bit also uh, as, uh, as another variant of the, the, the circle book from uh, Dave Eggers, who's writing about Facebook. He is writing about the people working there, while you are trying to evoke what happens to me when I am with my phone in my pockets and this, the, 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 the speedy, attention grabbing that comes constantly and that constantly derails me from what I really want to do and that you really did your best in the end to try to find some solace some 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 human touch and that was I guess was it when you when you wrote that book the book which was that the thing that you cling on to that you could only write this because you knew it couldn't end in a total catastrophe. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, I'm very aware uh, the book as a novel, it can't be propaganda. <clears throat> and so actually, uh, um, and that, that's my problem with, uh, with big tech. And that's everyone's problem with big tech, by the way, I believe, is that this isn't about the technology, which is great and fun. It's about the invisible operations behind the technology, which are, are harvesting our behavior. And of course, the more of our behavior they have, that we will come to be controlled uh, and, and probably already. Um, and so, I had to strike a balance between also the technology is fun as hell. I can think of a new app every day. And that was one of the most fun things uh, of writing the, uh, those newsfeed columns in the book is that every day you'd think, hey, what if, how about a dating, a dating app based on your, your pornography habits where it knows everything you look at, it knows where you freeze frame, where you pause, which things you go back and back to, and then it finds real people and all these mad things, which you go, you know, um, just nifty ideas. And yeah. uh, so, so your, your big I problem to, is, is the surveillance capitalism. 
Yeah, exactly. My big problem is surveillance, and that's very, it's very uncomfortable. If if I today uh, went to the registry of companies in any developed place and proposed a company which did what the big technology companies are doing in detail, if I said, I'm going to start a company which does this, which actually harvests your data, but also harvests your friends' data. It knows what your friends say about you. It knows what you say behind the backs of your friends. It knows your friends' faces. It can identify their voices. It records every word without limit to the storage of that. It records all your uh, your emotional words. Um, it, it has uh, your waking behavior. It knows your pulse. It knows your medical results. It knows your therapy sessions online. It knows what your therapist says about you when you've left the session. It knows um, all of the uh, uh, you know, all the details that you don't even know about your life. Um, it would be illegal if I went to open that. So this has been happening inch by inch by inch by inch. Now, of course, they've had to become very, very secret with that. Um, and we will never know. But the truth is, we're, it, it's, uh, you know, the algorithm is not uh, presented to us to examine. And Could so, we, sorry. The, well, it's the equivalent of, they found it. And also, I, I gather, I mean, I completely understand how exciting it is from the side of big tech because they they have a system whereby individual sheep go voluntarily to the abattoir. And exactly. Actually, uh, and it's like, well, perfect. Yeah, you know, we so, want it. Yeah. We want it, we do it, we, we give it for free. Exactly. And it seems a shame because we need it now, especially we're debating, really, we're not even debating, we're outraged at, at big questions of uh, abuse and racism and, all the all the issues which we've decided now have gone way too far. Um, this is a time specifically when we should have been facing a new start, a complete freedom of any of that kind of abusive ideology, and we should be empowered by possessing our data. Our, our behavior is is what we consist of. That is the most personal thing we have, and it should absolutely belong to us. All of the technology works perfectly well. They don't have to harvest anything to make the things that we love going to. But the fact that we love them gives them license, they think, to just steal, um, uh, secretly steal uh, our personalities. And, uh, and that's not correct. That should stop. And if we do what we should do as people, obviously things are very distracting at the moment, but I think that will stop and it has to stop at some point. It has to be a government decision. Do you, do you notice yourself giving in and uh, giving away your data yourself and giving away your attention yourself? Oh, of course, by, by having a phone, automatically you know how many hours are you on your phone not many hours but the fact that i use it the thing is there are too many contracts if i use any app on there um there are too many contracts to to stop everything happening they've discovered an academic in the states has calculated recently that our average internet usage in a year in order to be correctly and reasonably uh, um, consenting to the use of to, to their use of our data, it would take us seventy six days a year to review the contracts. <laughs> and so that a, a court the first time that gets to a to a good court of law, of course that's that is. A ridiculous position you know that's as good as saying well there isn't time to review the contract and the problem is if i use one app on my phone um it triggers up to 
70, 80, 100 other apps in the background. So I've signed consent on here, but of course written into the contract is that they have third party interests. And so there can be dozens of runaway apps harvesting in the background, um, you know, so. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's not, it's not viable to, to consent or not consent. They're taking what they want. I wanted to ask you, uh, as, as a more of an experiment that, uh, and this uh, has a bit to do with, with, with what you were just saying, there's always this, uh, writers always give writing advice or reading advice uh, and tell you about the tricks of the trade and how they do it and everybody's interested in it. I thought, uh, why don't we ask you, um, what should uh, a writer avoid? Um, maybe you can make it personal and just what 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 helps? What did you avoid uh, of, uh, out of all the advice and wise things people tell you about writing? What did I avoid? What did I ignore of advice? I tell you what I did, and but it was wrong. Um, when I met my agent, who's fabulous, I still have the, the same, the, the very first agent who, who, uh, who looked, who found my work. Um, and the first thing she told me was never listen to anyone. And of course, immediately then you're published and you have editors and other people, you know, telling you things. And because it's such a new space and you're in such a new milieu, suddenly, of course, you do what you're trying to position yourself. And, and I did listen to uh, other people. And this book is probably the first novel I've written, like the first one, completely free of any kind of influence. I, I'm, I'm, I, I can un I understand, I can understand. Um, uh, what about uh, uh, the, the 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 books that everyone should read? Are there books that everyone could also avoid just as well? Avoid to avoid books to avoid. Yeah. Uh, how about Bertrand Russell's History of Western Philosophy? <laughs> 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 I admit that I've tried it three times when I was a student and never really finished it. <laughs> I did the same thing. I still have it. I still have it. And the, my problem with it is, uh, and of course, it's a wonderful introduction to different ideas. But the problem is you get about two thirds of the way through and it starts being, uh, you can't help escaping the thought that it's Bertrand Russell's opinion on Western philosophy and is, you know, it's a little yeah. bit biased. And yeah. uh, so really it's a long conversation with Bertrand Russell and not necessarily the, the most objective view of uh, Western philosophy, but yeah, <laughs> avoid that. All right. And the, the, so you said the, uh, you were free when you uh, wrote your debut that, uh, uh, of advice. How did how did you came to writing the the, the debut? Did, did there was not an example that you were uh, someone that you were copying? It was really completely your own thing. Yeah, it it erupted by itself. Uh, it was very unusual. I literally I wrote a page in anger with that voice, uh, and I liked it enough. I kept writing and uh, I wrote I wrote the whole book very quickly in that voice and at the end discovered that I had 300 pages of the voice but nothing really happened to the character and at that moment I thought well actually this could be a real book and I went back and built his life around the voice and made sure that things were happening in uh, in real life. Otherwise, it was 300 pages of, of just him uh, complaining. Yeah. 
the 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 book now is um, was there also like th like that book I remember vividly the uh, from that book the 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 tone of that boy that was that that no fucking anybody understood him no one and it was no sense of you couldn't even try because the world would never understand him that was yeah. such a thing in his head and um, here there were more voices there were very different voices and i had a strange feeling that i i was both when i read it i was both the father and the nine-year-old daughter they were both just as near to me uh, how does that happen i don't know well characters build themselves and i don't know where they come from either it's very interesting um when the the engine starts in a novel and characters get a little bit of flesh around them um suddenly they do take on their life and uh you find that you can't make them do everything that you wanted because it would be out of character suddenly that's when you know you have uh, an individual character um but I don't know where they come from. I mean, Vernon is an obvious position because I was watching, I was inspired when I watched a new story of a teenager being put into a police car after a high school massacre or something similar. I didn't know the story at the time. Um, but I was writing in the, in the voice of that kid who was in a bad place. And, you know, and if you think about it, those adolescent years are very black and white years. You know, you either love something or you or you despise it and your parents don't get you and no one gets you. It's a very difficult uh, period to be in. Must be incredible. Thank fuck we didn't have social media back then, boy, because it must be really hardcore right now to try and grow up. And that period of life, and this is what pisses me off as well about some of the, the social media uh, companies, is that they target that that time of life because humans do not have independent personalities until later. And so when you come into, as soon as you pass 13, 14 years old, um, you're, you need your gang you respond to to uh you know group cues much more because you're formless you haven't settled on an opinion and you try different things out um and of course that's a perfect position to to addict people to needing input from outside um and normally speaking i understand from developmental psychologists etc normally that period ends as soon as you as soon as you um, start denying your friends opinions at the moment you can say well i like you and you're my friend but i disagree i don't agree with that um then you become an independent being and then you you move into adulthood but um the current uh, the current tools that we have are prolonging that period and so we're getting great tribal masses of people who haven't formed independent opinions it'll be a generation uh who've been able to follow these tribal herds using all their intelligence and all their strength but without having made the step to adulthood where they go wait actually do i really really agree with you know does this really make sense um and so you know, it's. Uh, I'm glad we didn't have that. Fuck, I would be a. I would be a wreck. Because yeah. I would love. You know, I would love this. I would have absolutely been. You know, I spent all my time on the internet if we had it when I was a kid. There's also that moment when you're a kid, uh, around the age of the girl of nine years old, that you discover that you can be a different person with different people. You discover yeah. that at your parents' house, you're a different person than with your friends. And when you go to a sport club, 
you could be someone else or there are different varieties that you can choose. But now these children, the moment that they have that choice, they have the internet and they think, okay, so I can be like this, I can be, uh, I can be on Instagram like this or like this or like this. But then every chosen identity is completely, is immediately on Instagram, on the social media, and it stays there forever. So you're also yeah. like pinned. It's like they're caged. Yeah. It's true. No, and then they're targeting you. They say, okay, oh, she likes lipstick. You know, they so target you like with that. advertising and with what you should see next. And so yeah, the, it, it seals the thing. It's, uh, it's not clever, but it's mm. extremely profitable. You know, uh, yeah. it's, it's something else that pisses me off if you look back at the at the first industrial revolution or even the the second so-called modernity at the beginning of the 20th century which is mass production right. um those booms of the railways and telephones and everything they also created whole cities they created vast millions and millions of jobs and they built buildings and they 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 created programs and they 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 made a human landscape. There was a human contract. Yeah. Um, whereas uh, this boom right here isn't doing that. It is simply accumulating some extremely rich people. But in I fact, see. you know, they're they're not building any cathedrals whatsoever. But why does everybody still believe in it? Why is there so little well, protest against it? I know, well, no, because we like it. We love the tech. I, I like the technology, you know. Yeah. It's the, the problem is that the, the capitalism needs the technology. The technology doesn't need that surveillance capitalism. And the reason that there can't be, so for instance, Sander, you and I, we would easily say, do you know what? I'm happy to just make $1 billion dollars I'm happy with one billion or even one million or even a hundred thousand dollars. And what we're going to do is just make this fabulous Twitter, Facebook, Google, whatever. We'll make this incredible service. Uh, but everyone keeps their data. Now we could launch that tomorrow. The problem is we would be either killed or bought and absorbed <laughs> by the other companies because it's also a, an oligopoly. Um, and so, it, you know, it has too much power. There's too much money in it, unfortunately. And it's a yeah. shame because, you know, I would be on all of those services, I'm sure, um, because they're fun, but the data would need to reside with me. And it would be incredibly interesting if we had our own data. Imagine if you looked after a year and it said, okay, you spent, you know, 38 hours on the toilet, you spent, 41 hours talking to this person your blood pressure always goes up when you see strawberry cake it always goes down when you see this and all the details which they're using are actually probably quite interesting but it's secret we cannot access them it's illegal for us to access them and we can't know what that information is because they're playing puppet with it in the background and um you know what we need is somebody i'm seeing there's a question uh can yeah. I screen? yeah i'm sure people i know there are some and of course we got signal and telegram and there, there are some services out there what we need is for them to achieve uh, the scale and uh, we do that by joining up of course but i am aware that there is especially in europe uh, a good movement towards uh um towards data possession yeah they use it, and uh, there should be but it's not the problem is you can't advise anyone not to use it's too much to have to leave the technology because we like it yeah you said europe as if you were not part of europe i'm in the uk that's europe okay it used to be europe yeah we have the yeah. same law we have the same gdpr yeah uh, and, and so and we're yeah, and the UK is Europe, only not European Union, but it is Europe. Um, yeah, thank you. Let's be very clear on that. Uh, 
the uh, I, I, I forgot the time, and indeed we have to uh, uh, look for some questions. And I guess I have done something wrong with the screen, and uh, uh, somewhere uh, move the little dots on the bottom. No, see the little dot bottom. right here. No, I have a. I'm there. No, <laughs> not with me. Um, I guess I, if I push question and answers, I can't Q and A. I can't see anything. Okay, so, do this. Do this. They're, they're in the chat. They're in the chat. Okay, yes. I'm looking for yes, chat five. All right, here we are. Okay, I have a question. Question from Melanie. Nowadays. Authors are asked to be on social media to promote their new books and more publishers are giving book deals, not just depending on the quality of the work, but on their social media reach. Are you worried about the future of book publishing for yourself or in general, for debutant, for example, that doesn't want to give away their data, data online? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in, in short, yeah, it's been happening. Again, it's a function of, of neoliberal capitalism. It was happening even before uh, social media, which really is only the last decade that we've had absolutely been taken by the balls. Um, but it's true. Listen, the bookshops here turned into chains. And after a while, uh, the chains declared that it was in everyone's interest and it was in the reader's best interest if they only carried the top 250 best-selling books. And so I, we are under threat and it's not just uh, from things like uh, writers having to come with their own ready-made audience, but we're, we're living through after a century of, of science and scientific knowledge, which is now the new God and the professors are the new priests. Um, and I agree, I'm completely uh, a scientific uh, person and, and I agree that a peer reviewed study is extremely good evidence. But I think the problem is that has married with digital life and we're now obsessed with metrics and you see now it's a technique uh, among companies that they automatically every month they will fire the the lowest 10 percent of their performing employees and hire new ones really yeah and they have because the office now is wired uh, they can tell how long you're on the phone, how where you are in the building, how long you're in the toilet, and they get metrics, they get data. Um, and us looking at graphs, you know, this is our big problem, and it's not just writers, it's everyone, is that our humanity is going to uh, be washed away by this. Because I'm sure it's true, every company, of course, will have 10% of people who, who perform below average but it may not be the same 10%. And anyway, no matter what people you have in there, there will always be a 10% who don't perform. So, you know, in the interest of profit, we're prepared to just sack 10% of our company um, in order to, to boost sales. And uh, this is happening with books in bookshops where if it's not a bestseller, it's a big problem for poetry, which is the pinnacle of writing really is is the godhead of 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 literature um but poetry is more difficult and and they see it as more niche and of course it's becoming more and more difficult to be published as a poet and you really have to be you know to make it a long and, and hard life um yeah. so yeah uh, absolutely it's it's a problem and that will only continue metrics yeah metrics yeah. are going to will wipe out the the human element which is okay. fun you know if which is I, fun it's fun humanity is fun yeah uh humanity is cool 
I would be drinking almost exclusively with the bottom 10% of that company. I, I virtually can sense it. Uh, okay, ne ne next question is, uh, do you use a smartphone? I think I think I already asked you and you already answered that one. Yeah, this is it right here. Yeah, it's all going. It's all going. <laughs> It's all going back to Google. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck off, Next Google. Question from Ian. When will you visit the Netherlands again? Will you come to Crossing Border in November? <laughs> Very good. Yeah, uh, I would love to. I, would love, I won't be going to Crossing Border in November because this is, uh, this is my mini Crossing Border right here. So I'll, I'll get drunk after the, after the show. Oh, you but, can start already. That's not a problem with getting but, drunk. Um, yeah, as soon as I can, as soon as I can. You know, Good. I'm actually sitting. The place where I am in in England is the nearest piece of UK land to Holland to uh, the Netherlands. So I'm facing you just across the water. And <laughs> if I had a boat, I could I could get over there. Yeah, you couldn't come now because in a few minutes the evening clock will uh, will start again at nine. Ah, oh, you're on um, curfew. We have a curfew exactly. I'm I'm, qu I'm quickly going to ask to to, to go there's through wind, the other there's questions. There's wind bear. There's one from DJ Wim Bere. What a great, yeah, great Wim Bere, power. famous great, Wim Bere. What a great interview. Glue to the screen. Thank you. I know for sure in time it will become a novel that people will refer to in the same way as they do to some great Dylan songs. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. And do another workshop. The last one I attended was amazing. Someone says, Pauline says, What's, what kind of workshop does she mean at, at, at the Crossing Border Festival? Yeah, hey, we did one. Yeah, we did one a few years ago. Creative uh, writing. About writing, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. Good. That was that was cool. It's kind of unusual because I'm not a teacher, and um, it's uncomfortable to imagine that that I have anything particularly to teach. But uh, but I'm starting to think anyway. Just the just the spirit for writing and the spirit to not give up is uh, is something I can pass on. I, I, I'm, I'm interested in the... Wilson, the... Kitty. Hey, guys. I, I'm sorry, the... I can't see. Uh, you, you're a bit better at the chat. So uh, um, I'd love to see you um, next time. Um, uh, I, I, we're going, we can ask Cross and Border if we can do a workshop in which you tell us what to avoid as a writer and what, uh, what rules not to, uh, to, to go after and just how to yeah. be yourself. I think so. Well, listen, let me tell you one way of being a writer, which is very effective. It works for me. Um, and it is something which metrics and science would absolutely uh, kill us for. But uh, it works. And that is the beautiful human capacity for delusion. Where when I sit down to write a book, I say to myself, I'm going to write this in 21 days, like Bukowski. Yeah. I'm just going to go every night and in 21 days, the whole book is written. And so I do that. I begin. And after 21 days, I'm not finished. I give myself an extra week and I keep doing that for two more years. <laughs> and in the end, you have a book <laughs> because if I sit down, the human brain is, is, is what we must avoid when we're writing. We, we mustn't think too much. And if I sit down and say, this is the first day of a two year job, I'm going to get up and, and go down the pub and not do it. Whereas if I think uh, I'm going to do this in such, with such momentum that it's going to be finished in a month, then I'll begin. Then it's a challenge, but I just have to extend the month 24 times. I know that we have uh, we, that we are going over the, our time, but still, just one other question: How um, how do you do you stop your head? Because 
I can imagine that you're in the tone, you're walking with the person. Uh, the moment that you're not writing, you're doing something else. The person is living their, your, their life in your head yeah. somewhere. How can you stop, to stop having these meta thoughts about the person and these literary thoughts? Okay, well, that, you can't stop them, of course. You're absolutely right. And that's one of the things that, that gets a book written is that uh, once you begin, it doesn't leave you alone. And everything you see is useful for the book suddenly. Um, but in terms of making it work for the book, I split them into two seasons. So the first draft is where all the spirit go. That's where non-thinking, just all the spirit and write down anything that comes to your mind. It's about the feeling. Um, and then a second season, which is structural and editing, and that is a thinking season where you can put things in better order and you can maybe change words and, and edit some words out. And by keeping them in two seasons, then it means that I don't fuck up one or the other. If I have too much, if I have too much thinking in the first one, then the spirit gets lost because I'm constantly stopping to correct things. Um, and likewise, in the second season, if I still have all these crazy feelings, then I'm not going to stop and actually turn the thing into a book. So I separate the seasons and uh, that seems to work. And then what you do in, the, the, in the, the second season when you're busy, then doesn't it sometimes, isn't it sometimes very difficult to, um, uh, to not help your characters? I, uh, I knew this was a good book the moment that uh, our uh, uh, Lon, the, the main person, who uh, uh, has to go to his neighbor's house and he doesn't uh, want to go and he has, he has never introduced himself at his neighbor's and he tells himself that it must have been because he was too lazy and that he's always a little bit of a lazy guy. And that was the reason. Well, I thought, no, that's not true. It's not it's because you're a bit ashamed, uh, shy and you're a bit ashamed for making that introducing. So I had another thought about him. Isn't it difficult for you as a writer then to not protect him sometimes and to help him a little bit? Uh, I don't know if it's difficult. I know in the end, in the end, things happen that have to happen. I mean, it, if he's salvageable, he should get saved in the end. I won't give the book away, um, but uh, no, you have to be you have to be harsh with them and, and see how they respond. And then you also learn about the character. It's interesting. It's like what I was telling you that the, after a certain point, they develop so much that they will no longer behave outside of their character. But it means that you can put them suddenly into a weird situation and see what happens because you've internalized them and, and you know how they would behave. And so um, it's one of the great tests, I think, when you're thinking about characters in a book um, is to imagine them in different situations. If you want to write a book and you're going to use this person right here, stop for a minute and think how... What, what would they look like in church? What would they, how would they be in a fight? How would they be if the police suddenly turn up and arrest them for no reason, like, like in a Kafka novel or something? And, um, and there you start to see the edges of the character and you start going, okay, that character would never go to church, for instance, but what if they were in church? then they're going to be uncomfortable. And you start feeling who the character is by imagining them in, in different situations. It's, uh, it's fun. Yeah, I see. Okay. Was, is it difficult now to uh, say goodbye to these characters from this book? In the end, well, I spent long enough with them. Um, it's a very interesting thing, finishing uh, a book like that. And that was a pretty long job. That took some years. Um, and in the middle of it, of course, you know, I, sometimes I have tears because I get too involved in, in a scene or I laugh and 
So the thing is playing music back to me. Um, but honestly, by the time you write the end and it's edited through, I'm quite ready for it to walk. And within a few weeks, I'm just another reader. And it's always very, it's unusual for me that anyone asks me a question about a book because you, you just feel like another reader and it happened kind of automatically by itself. It's very strange. Um, but uh, no, I tell you one thing though, one thing I do, especially because these books, um, these books have difficult themes. Uh, uh, some people, especially today, can find them a bit controversial just because they tackle certain issues uh, front on. And one thing that I try and do with every book just for my own satisfaction is make sure that it can defend itself. So the book has to be strong enough if I'm going to treat a controversial subject and if it's due to a, a strong belief or if I'm coming to the book with a strong feeling, I have to make sure that when the critics much later, after it's published, when the critics say, ah, you know, that's ridiculous. And, you know, if they give it an extremely bad review, I want, I want to be confident that the book defends itself perfectly. And this book possibly does that more than many because there are so many different voices in there. Uh, chances are anyone who really, really disagrees with this book is probably in the book already. <laughs> and I already, I already made fun of them in the book. And so that's fine, you know. But, our, yeah, we have to, like raising a child, I guess, you know, you have to make sure it's, it's strong enough that when you can't answer for it and it's alone with a bunch of, of ruffians, it will come out fine and be able to defend itself. And once that moment's reached, then I'm happy for it to go walking. Okay, good. Thank you. I think we, we really, we, uh, we could go on. I could really love, like to ask. Yeah, you, it's good chatting you with you guys. Uh, I'll, I'll look if there is another question I have to, to read. Oh, no, only very nice compliments to you. Um, to us. Okay. Hmm? To us. To us, to us. Hey, thanks so much. And everybody who watched, I would really read the book and expect to go and read it twice because it's a great, great book. I really loved it. And also a book that you can really be angry about and like, like what is the, that man doing with me now? Those are always the best books. So thanks for that. Care. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope we can do a workshop or anything else in uh, uh, The Hague soon. Me too. Oh, me too. Uh, if we can do this in person, we'll have a wonderful time. Well, fingers crossed that this is the last year of the apocalypse. And uh, you know, hopefully by summertime, things look very different. And I'm coming immediately to, we're going to eat some Leckerbecker sticks. And, uh, <laughs> do all those fabulous things we do in all, in the Netherlands. Let's do them all. Okay, thank you. Thanks um, everyone, hey. Yeah, big hi